Hello and welcome to the Fish Nerds, the show about fish, fishing, and eating fish. I'm Clay Groves, your host, licensed fishing guide, and chief executive fish nerd of the Fish Nerds podcast. Super happy once again to be here. Sorry you missed last week's show. I fell asleep. Uh, my guest bailed. Dog ate my show. I don't know what happened. I didn't get a show out. I'm so sorry. But we're back in the game. If you're new to the show, this show we talk about fish, fishing, and eating fish. I just said that. Today on this show, we are super duper lucky, like really lucky, to have the chance to talk with Greg Myerson. You might recognize that name, especially if you're a striper fishing nerd. He owns the world's record striper company, co-author of his own biography called Born to Fish. He won a deal on Shark Tank, uh, and of course he couldn't wait to come on the Fish Nerds when his new book came out, which we read as part of the Fish Nerds Book Club, the Effin Book Club, and we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. I also, a few weeks ago, I promised to start talking about fishy sex more often, because you love the dirty stuff. Uh, so tonight we're going to talk about the spawning habits of, uh, you know, largemouth bass, because it's that time of year where they're coming to their spawning beds and it's worth talking about. So we're going to talk about fish sex. Oh, yeah. <laughs> then there's a really funny thing about doing this podcast and, and having an online presence is I got contacted by a high school kid who's working on a project to help him earn his graduation. And of course, he had to come to the Fish Nerds to uh, earn his graduation credits. So really, really exciting. Before we jump into Born to Fish, talking with Greg Myerson, we are just about to reach our 200th episode of the Fish Nerds podcast. Going on five years, lots of interesting things have happened. The show has grown and changed and all kinds of wackiness. But we always try to have fun on the show. So for our 200th show, if you're a fan of the show, get your phone out and call 607-378-FISH. That's the Fish Nerds hotline, 607-378-FISH. And I want you to leave us uh, on our voicemail. Say your names. Like, hi, my name is Clay. And if you have a website or a product, you can plug your product. I don't care. Uh, and say, and then tell us a fishy joke and, you know, say congratulations on your 200 show. Whatever, whatever you want to say. Be as fun as you want. Make fun of us. We don't care. Uh, so here's an example. I'm going to pretend I'm a caller. I'm going to dial 607 beep boop boop 378 fish. Boop boop beep boop 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 boop. Hi, my name is Clay from the Fish Nerds. Congratulations on your 200th episode. Unbelievable. Soon you may want to learn how to edit better. You know, whatever you want to say. Uh, what's the difference between a piano and a fish? You can tune a piano, but you can't tune a fish. Okay, bye. Something just like that. Whatever you want to do. You could tell us a story. You could tell us a joke. We don't care. Uh, don't, don't, don't tell us any racist uh, jokes if you can avoid them. Uh, but tell us funny jokes. Fish jokes are good jokes. Okay? So 607-378-FISH. Uh, and uh, we'll play it. But be sure and tell us your name, where you're from, you know, whatever you want to say. Totally good. Totally good. So now, now it's time to talk about Born to Fish. So here we go. Next up, we have the uh, world's greatest fisherman, <laughs> Greg Meyerson on the show. Let me describe his book to you. This is, this is from his website. Born to Fish, How an Obsessed Angler Became the World's Greatest Straight Bass Fisherman. Born to Fish tells the story of a man who led a harrowing, sometimes dissolute life until he turned himself around, thanks to his rod and reel. Overcoming learning disabilities, substance abuse, and the violence associated with a fisher a father, excuse me, in the mob. Greg Myerson, a lifelong sport fisherman, caught an 82-pound striped bass back in 2011, shattering a world record that had stood for 29 years. Without any training or biological research, he began studying the striped bass like a scientist, examining how it hunts, the food it eats, 
and how its behavior is affected by moon phases and the cycles of the tides, which led to the creation of the Rattlesinker, the lore that helped him catch the record-setting bass. During his appearance on the TV show Shark Tank, Mark Cuban bought one-third, 33%, share of Greg's company, World Record Striper Company. Yet at that very instant, he achieved his crowning glory as a striped bass fisherman, he had a staggering epiphany and instantly regretted killing the fish. Greg is now at the forefront of the effort to save the big striped bass. The most prolific breeders the, and actively promotes no-kill, catch, and release tournaments. So we're excited about this. This is right up our alley. Uh, I actually read the book. We're going to talk about it. Uh, you'll hear about it on the interview with Greg. Uh and the whole time I'm reading this book, and you should read it too, uh, you're going to find out. You're going gonna to wonder how is he even not in jail. Really great story. Uh, and it's actually a good book. You're going to like it. We're giving one away, an autographed copy. If you stay tuned after the interview, we will tell you how you can win your very own copy of Born to Fish. Okay, fish nerds, we're super excited. We have with us today... Greg Meyerson uh, from the uh, World Record Striper Company and author or co-author of the Born to Fish brand new book. I guess coming out the 15th. That's right. And uh, yeah, we're, we're excited about it. And just a little point of background, um, Greg uh, owns the record for the world's largest striper ever caught uh, and the World Record Striper Company won a, a, a gig on Shark Tank with Mark Cuban. Uh, which we talked about in the show before. Uh, you, by the way, Greg, you are a, uh, the sixth person from Shark Tank that's been on our show. Oh, <laughs> so, excellent! Yeah, we we frequently deal with uh, Shark Tank winners here. So usually they come before they win Shark Tank. After they win, they don't call me anymore. So we're excited to <laughs> get, <laughs> excited to get you on here. Hey, uh, congratulations! By the way, on the book. I know how difficult it is to get these things done. Yeah, yeah, it's been a long time coming. Yeah, and you you worked with uh, with Tim Gallagher on this project, right? Yeah, I mean, Tim was I was approached by uh, uh, Russ Galen, who uh, is a literary agency in Manhattan, maybe five years ago or six years ago about this, and uh, you know they hired Tim, who became a a good friend of mine over the last five years. We spent a lot of time together, and you know a lot of the of the parts of the book are. No, there was a lot of things that Tim and I had to go through together too. There was a lot of a lot of uh, crazy stuff went on. You know, ter- some of it was pretty terrible. You know, so um, you know, part of the story is part of the relationship that grew out of him and I just starting to write this book. You know, he um, he lost his son. Uh, oh, you know. Geez. You know, I, I got really sick. He saved my life. <laughs> it was just, you know, a bunch of crazy stuff. And uh, we fish together all the time. And he sleeps on my couch all the time and uh, does interview. You know, writing this book, you you, know, you just you're you're with the guy so much that you just you know, it, hopefully you're with someone that you like. And you know, Tim and I really, uh, you know, he gets my humor and and uh, we you know it wasn't painful at all. Well, that's that's really great. Well, he did he he you know the, it's it's a tough writing is a tough process anyway. But I'm glad. But I mean, I I read the book, and to be honest, I thought the book was going to be like a a had a bass fish kind of book. Yeah, no, not at all. No, I am so glad it's not that book. I am so glad the the arc is you. It's, yeah. it's like a it's like a it's a it's almost like a like an American story. You know, it's it's uh it's crazy. You know, it's you know it's. Um, my life has been a really wild ride and, um, you know, I've had so much go on that, uh, you know, my brother, my brother went to war, you know, my brother, my father was in the mob, you know, my mother was a teacher, you know, I was always out fishing, you know, it, it, it just brings up all these stories that, that, uh, really, I mean, don't have a lot to do with fishing, you know? <laughs> no. Which, which which is good because you know we all fishing is fishing is an activity of like the more you do it the better you get at it you need to yeah. kind of improve gradually but your but your story so so actually my our fishing li- fish nerds librarian Jeff Danielson he works over in Kansas City 
he sent in some stuff and he wrote in here first off it really seems like that fishing fishing has been the rock of of greg's of your life the one constant th- thing through all your ups and downs uh and and craziness i mean because this book really is like I, I was reading it and as i was getting getting in i was visualizing the movie you right know? Yeah. but fishing is that common thread so when your life got crazy you went fishing so we want to hear your thoughts on on that how does fishing temper your your adventures <laughs> yeah no i mean fishing for me i try to keep as a hobby because i never want to lose the passion for it you know and all the business and the rattle sinker stuff and everything that's come out of it has been, it's all been great, but I've always fought it trying, you know, like I never really promote the business. I never really wanted a, to do a story or a book or, you know, I, 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 you know, I wasn't, I wasn't looking to catch a world record, you know, it, and I'm just trying to keep fishing my passion. It's always been something that I always went to, to, escape you know it, it's 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 what i do to escape to escape all the bullshit in life you know so oh, and, and there's a lot of it <laughs> yeah yeah so i yeah. never want to lose that you know and and uh and people don't get that sometimes they're like you should be making this company this or that and i'm like you should shut the hell up and then let me do what i right. want to do right well, it, well it seems like in your book you've always been you're going to do whatever you want to do anyway <laughs> Yeah. Like that's that's that was what I took from like I mean, this kid this this guy doesn't take shit from anybody and does not, his own thing except for except for with your daughter your daughter yeah. like now is yeah. is your focus but but uh, but I'm reading this I'm like God I'm just I'd be afraid to hang out with you <laughs> no you know you know I, I, I'm not the easiest person in the world to deal with because I'm just I've just been totally incapable of dealing with bullshit you know but mm-hmm. but um. I'm not a bad guy, you know what I mean. I, I have, I have a heart. <laughs> right, and 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 the, and the heart comes through in the book too. And there, but there are some parts in this where I mean, this for people. I'm not going to give away everything in the book, but there is, there is uh, action in this book. There's fights. There's adventure. There's times at sea where your boat is sinking and yeah. you're still fishing. You don't <laughs> stop for anything. You're just going. I know. Uh, and and yeah. it's funny because and and by the way, your 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 quest uh, of your your fishing for your striped bass, you're kind of really getting to know that one fish. That that's the very definition of fish nerd. You have focused on like obsessively on this fish, and so you are not that different than us. You're a fish nerd. You're 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 working on this all the way. Uh, one more thing from from Jeff. It says your childhood boating adventures and secret trapping business wouldn't fly with most parents today. <laughs> um, Jeff was turned loose in the woods with a gun, fishing rod, knapsack, sandwich, and canteen. Uh, Jeff wonders if you think uh, that the time window on that kind of freedom for kids is closed, or does it still exist somewhere? You know, I'm sure there's parts of the country where it still exists, but mm-hmm. uh, you know, walking down the street through Connecticut with a, with a 22, it doesn't fly anymore. You know, <laughs> no, that's um, frowned upon, <laughs> <laughs> you know, when I was a kid, I walked down the street with guns and a sack full of muskrats and traps hanging off me and no one really thought much about it. But you, if you did that now, you know, uh, I think I'd be probably locked up pretty quick, but, uh, I mean, I'm sure there's parts that, you know, you know, Mer- America's got some great, great spots where where it's untouched still you know and and uh and it hasn't been destroyed by technology yet you know uh and, and i hope that never you know i hope that never changes yeah i hope so would you let your daughter do that she says hey dad i'm uh give me, give me a gun i'm going muskrat hunting <laughs> i would love that i would love that you know here you go see you kid yeah. <laughs> it would give me it would you know we have I do play Barbies with her, you know, or I used to when she was younger anyway, you know, and my, my, my Barbie playing is, is, uh, is pretty comical, you know, it, uh, there's a, I'm, I'm bad Ken. There's a good Ken and there's a bad Ken and I, I play bad Ken and she, she gets a kick out of that, you know? And, uh, that's funny. We used to, we used to bring Barbies out ice fishing with the kids. I, I have an 11 <laughs> year old daughter. And yeah. we would take a catch a fish and have Barbie hold the fish in the photo and take a photo. And it would look like she caught the world's record, you know, pumpkins. <laughs> yeah. <And laughs> yeah. yeah that was, that's of, my Barbie play. Yeah. Yeah. No, my daughter's great. You know, she, she is, uh, she's getting to be at the age where she likes to, she's a prankster and, 
Mm-hmm. And she's a good kid, you know, and she keeps me, she keeps, you know, if it wasn't for her, I probably would have died a while ago. You know, I just, I was just running so wild. And then when she came around and, and, uh, you know, my, my whole outlook on life mellowed out, you know, I, uh, yeah, well, I, well, I mean, I was reading this book and I was thinking about your daughter and I was thinking, gosh, you know, like you, you, this book is so honest. I think and this is one of the things I liked about it yeah. is you didn't keep anything. You said, okay, I was into drinking. I was into drugs. I was partying. I was doing all these things. Yeah. And I was wondering, and you're fighting, like fighting, like every, like every chapter you're punching someone. <laughs> and, and, I, and I was wondering, like, would I, if, if this was, if, if I wrote a book like this or I was part of a book like this, yeah. would, I have 11 year old daughter. Would I let her read this book? Have you, will your daughter read this book? Yeah, you know, um, you, you know, the thing about that is, you know, the good part about the book for for her is that she could, like, she sees this guy and she sees how he, I deal with people, and and she she is like probably questioning some things, you know, like how does he get away with doing what he does and saying what he does and acting like he does. And, and then she could read the book someday and, and be like, all right, this is what he's gone through. This is what he's had to deal with. This is where he came from. This is a part of my family. I never met. They're all gone. And mm-hmm. she could learn where she came from and, and, and understand, under start putting some pieces together, you know? Right. Why, why is she the one eating Xanax now? <laughs> so the, <laughs> Right. <laughs> Sorry. Right. So, so I mean, I, I enjoyed the book an awful lot. A lot of fun to read. Um, my, my favorite anecdote was when you were fishing for your big striped bass and, and the lobster pops were in the way and you were yeah. moving them. First of all, I'm, I'm not even sure that's legal. But, right. uh, but, second, <laughs> but second, I love that when, when, you were, uh, when you were confronted by the lobster men, you just got in a fight with them and then they backed down and let you. <laughs> let you yeah. have the fishing spots. I'm wondering how come you're not in jail. Well, <laughs> you know, uh, you, you know, a lot of people get into fights, and you know what? Like I was in one this morning almost. But the the thing is, they need to happen. You know, people people sure. are people are too soft. I mean, that's why that's why these tragedies happen out there. I mean, people kids don't know how to act anymore. You know what I mean? It's, it, they're afraid. They, they they'll, they'll just grab a gun and and act out. You know. When, Mm -hmm. when, when things are met face to face and ironed out, they're ironed out, you know, whether it's argument of words or, or if it becomes a fist fight. So you don't hold a grudge. You have to fight and you're like, okay, we're done. I don't ever hold a grudge. You know, let's get it over with and let's get it out there and let's move on. You know, that's, that's, that's what's not happening these days. Yeah, so people bottle it up and they explode yeah. later on. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still, I'm glad you're not in jail. I'm still surprised by it. <laughs> I, yeah, I am too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so has has uh, has there been any talk about the next step from this book? So the book's just coming out like th- this week. As this show comes out, this book's gonna be coming out. Cool. Um, what's next? Has, has there been optioning for? Have you already had talks about like next steps for the book, or is it just like promote the book for a while and then see what happens? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the the promoting the book and getting the book out there and letting people see what it's about is, is you know, there's been talk about other things and 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 uh, people think that it would be a great a great movie, you know, somewhere along the lines of like uh, you know, like the Legends of the Fall or a River Runs Through It type thing. Uh, eventually, yeah, like a, with River Runs Through It, Through It, but with like fights. Yeah, like a, a river of blood much. runs through it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> the river of death. Maybe we could have Brad <laughs> starring Pitt. Greg Myers. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. That's really cool. Now, um, so you, if you, at 2000 and what, 13 or 12, you won Shark Tank with Mark Cuban. Yeah. Right? I don't know if you could exactly say I won it. You know, I got a deal. Well, uh, you got yeah. a deal. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, what does that, what does that mean now a few years later? Are you, do you, does it still keep going or is it just kind of like a well, background deal? Well, the contract with Shark Tank ran out May first, three years uh-huh. from the from my from my. Uh, so they don't own me anymore. They owned well, me for good. three years, and and it really messed me up. I I, I was going to fill in for Tread Barda on his show when he got sick, and I couldn't do that. Um, you know, a bunch of things stopped me from doing things. Oh, because they can, 
Yeah. They control your TV appearances. Right. They would have, they would have took everything, you know? So, so, you know, the book couldn't even come out until now because it's a con they waited until this contract ran out for the book to come out. Um, so the timing was just kind of right in yeah. there. Yeah. But as far as the company, Mark Cuban owns 33% and he, mm -hmm. he will continue to own that until he either sells his shares or parts of the company off. Um, that's usually what he'll, you know, what those guys do. They, they buy a piece of the company. They try to make it grow. Uh, you know, as soon as you know, there's a lot of due diligence when a company is bought stacks of papers mm -hmm. and what he's doing is he's setting it up so that he's breaking the company up into shares and he's making it easier to sell the company later on down the road. If it becomes something bigger and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's what he does, you know, he's, so if I, if I get the world record striper company really cranking or, or we get the rattlesinker mass produced and put everywhere, you know, then, then his shares will be worth a lot of money and he could, he could sell them off to a bigger company or do whatever he wants. Interesting. Yeah. It's, it's always fascinating to me to see how this all works. Now um, I want to talk about conservation in one second here, but are you making a full-time living now in the fishing industry or do, are you still oh, no. uh, electrician? No, I'm, I'm, I'm an electrical inspector. You know, uh, that's what I oh, do. Cool. Yeah. I, you know, I, uh, I'm building an airport right now uh, in Oxford, Connecticut. And um, you know, that's, that's my job. I've done it all my life, you know? So, Fishing, like I said, is my hobby, and and you know, I, I I it is a small business for me that's growing, but I try to keep it that way, you know, uh, mm -hmm. just a, a side thing. Um, you know, if it ever gets really big, you know, I'll turn it over to someone else or, or whatever. I just sure. don't want I don't want to lose my passion for fishing to to make it work and not like it anymore, you know. I understand. I opened a charter business a couple of years ago, ice fishing charters, and it's been harder work than I thought. So oh, I get charters it. are brutal. <laughs> Charters are the worst. They are. Uh, yeah. Well I, well, I just opened a summertime charter. I just bought a boat for my summer business as well. So I get it. Yeah. But uh, hey, so I want to talk about, this is important because you, you came into this conservation conversation in your book, which I think is the most important message yeah. in the whole book. Uh, yeah. and, it, and it kind of really aligns with my values. And, and so you caught the world record striper. You had to kill this fish. Uh, to get, <laughs> if you, if you, in order to get these records, you have to kill these things. Yeah. Uh, and, and then you came to terms with the reality of that means I'm taking a large breeder out of a population of fish that's already in trouble. Right. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. You know, I, you know, all my life I, I, I've killed fish and caught fish and killed the animals and skinned them. And, you know, it was never really, you know, it, it never bothered me that much. It, you know, it was just something that we did, you know, and, it, it, but then for some reason, I don't know, you know, I was looking at the world record striped bass in the cooler and I'm, uh, it's in the back of the truck and I'm looking at it and I'm looking at it and I'm studying it. And I'm like, and a biologist is taking a sample, a fish scale off of it at that time and to age it. And I'm, I, it started running through my head. I'm like, like what a great fish, you know? And, mm -hmm. and, and I killed it, you know, the, maybe one of the greatest striped bass that ever swam. And here it is. I, I wiped it out. You know, it, right. it's, it's going made through. it 30 years just fine. And then you got yeah, it. I mean, it's go and I started to think about what it went through, you know, nor'easters and hurricanes and mm -hmm. red tides and fishing boats. And it had hooks in its face and, and it made it past everything. And then it hit me and I, I was ready for it. And I, I, I wiped it out. I mean, why, you know, I mean, why did, I mean, couldn't I have got this piece of paper that said I get the world record, um, without killing it? You know, so that I, I called up the IGFA and I started talking with them and they were like, you know what, let's promote, let's promote the catch and release category, you know, and, and it became, it became, uh, a record that I, I had to get to, to start. So I, you know, it start the category. So I got the catch and release world record. Uh, it wasn't a huge fish. It was started at around 45 inches or so, but it, you know, it had to be, uh, set the bar for the next guy, you know? and and then I started thinking about all the tournaments that I've been to and witnessed all these dead fish laying around after the tournament, all these breeder size, big female striped bass. And they're all laying around on a dock and nobody even wants them. You know, they can't even give them away. So it's so sad. <laughs> yeah. You know, it started really bothering me. I, you know, I, 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 and I, and I started to, you know, wonder what, you know, what could I do with this world record? 
to make it worse. I mean, it's a piece of paper. It doesn't really mean anything. I mean, maybe I'll use this fish and any kind of publicity I get or whatever to, to have a purpose, you know, to, to save striped bass. I mean, to, to help save striped bass and, and promote conservation. And, you know, since right. that, you know, since that's happened, I've, I've, you know, I've, I've, a lot of people call me to do tournaments. Like how do I, they want to know, you know, what they should do and, and how they should run their tournament. And, and, and I always tell them, if you don't have a catch and release tournament now, don't even bother. You're just going to get destroyed online with all the conservation going on right now. And, 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 uh, the state of the striped bass, you need to have a catch and release tournament, promote that. And I give them tips on how to run the tournament, where they could get the, the, the measurement devices, and how to catch you know whoever has the biggest fish you know send an email to one person and and let them send out a mass text to everybody in the tournament so that you know the bar to set right now is 40 inches or 41 inches don't even bother measuring your fish or taking it out of the water if it's not going to be that big if you don't even think it's close with with modern with modern technology it baffles me that people need to hang a fish on a wall i know to show the size of it anymore Um, because you can get you can yeah. yeah I mean, the, the mount, the mount of the striped bass, I won't even look at it. I don't even want to see it. I gave it to, I gave it to uh, my buddies at uh, take a vet fishing. They bring it and use it to promote take a vet fishing, uh, functions. You know, I had it sitting there and I would sit on the couch and I would look at it and I would just be like disgusted with myself. So, you know, it's out there doing good now. You know, it's, it's, it's bringing kids around, take a vet fishing. They want to help out. You know, it's going to all these different functions and stuff like that. I, I really don't want anything to do with it. Yeah, but it's, you know, it's, it's now it's, so she's like a martyr fish. She's traveling around getting the attention and, <laughs> yeah. and hopefully, hopefully yeah. getting the cause across. Now in New Hampshire, we have, I live in New Hampshire and we have that big uh, rotary ice fishing derby every year, statewide ice fishing derby. Right. And I won't participate in that for the same reason of you they're we're catching they're they're catching 40 year old lake trout right. the breeders yeah and they're hanging them on a board to win prizes and then that then that gets sent to the um to the to feed the raptors at the science center yeah. and i'm like what is this like you guys like yeah like modernize like let's get up here and 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 then every year the fishermen are complaining that there's not enough fish out there i'm like well right. you're not even eating it you're just killing them so um, now I was in I was in the Chesapeake Bay region uh, last year down in uh, Virginia, Virginia Beach, and they sell striped bass in all the stores as sustainable seafood, right? You have to figure yeah. out Whole Foods and that sort of thing, but they don't call it striped bass; they call them rockfish, right? And yeah. and uh, do you think that's a marketing ploy because they know that people won't eat stripers? It probably is. You know, I I I, I will never ever buy striped bass. Uh, you know, and I, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure, you know, they, they, they have hybrid fish in the markets and stuff, but when I look at them in the markets, you know, I could see that these are, there's a lot of wild striped bass in there too, you know, and I'm sure legally they could sell some and, you know, uh, as long as they're managing this fishery the way it should be, then there's not a problem with that. I mean, I understand fishermen have to make money. I mean, they have to work, you know, but it's gotta be done, uh, you know, right. And not, and not, and they got to really crack down on the people that are not doing it right and, and that are poaching it. And, and, uh, because there, I mean, people that buy or, or actually sell striped bass, you know, everybody knows somebody that's done it or does it, you know, there's a lot of money in that, but sure. You know, it's gotta be, it's really gotta be, uh, and you know, it's gotta be cracked down on the, the, the they could really wipe out a lot of fish. You know, a, a guy that's out of work and catching a bunch of fish every night and selling them is doing a lot of damage. And there's a lot of people like that, you know? Sure. Well, and you want those guys out of work to be able to make a living, too. Yeah. Right? We don't want yeah, I mean, to take food off their table. But maybe I like your in the book, you talk about slot limits, right? which to me makes such perfect sense. Those right. mid-sized fish where there's tons of them. You know, <laughs> you maybe take males out, not the females. I don't know. Some other way of like of allowing people to eat fish, but not wreck the population. Just taking the big fish just seems to be dumb. Yeah. I mean, the so. striped bass, it's America's fish, you know, it's, it, it needs it to is. be, it's always been here. It's been here before we got here. 
and it needs to be protected, you know, and, and, yeah, and they, they need to have a us. plan. The plan needs to be <laughs> yeah. a good one. Yeah. And I, I saw you on Instagram this morning with a fly rod and a tiny striper. <laughs> yeah. Was that, did you catch that today? I cast about 18,000 times last night for that striped bass. Oh, that's, that's the biggest, that's as big as my biggest striped bass I've ever caught. So that's, that's my, that would be my world record if I caught that fish. <laughs> no, you know, the worm hatch is one of my favorite things. It goes on in uh, uh-huh. a lot of the salt ponds in Rhode Island. They, when the bottom of the yep. ponds warm up, the cinder worm, the, the cinder worms start to hatch and it, it's a, mm-hmm. it's a, it's a feeding frenzy going on. And I go out there this time of year for about a month, you know, as many nights as I can. And I tie, I, I love to be able to catch fish on stuff that I make, like whether it's a rattlesnake or, you know, a cinder worm fly or even trout or anything I catch. I, I like doing it on things that I make, you know, because the well, to outsmart it's a fish with something I make is part of the game for me, you know? Mm-hmm. So I, I get a lot, I get, it's really rewarding for me to be out there trying to catch those small stripers on the fly rock, you know, with the flies that I make. It's that's, that's awesome. Now, now, so striped bass fishing is really cool and all that. And, and I'm, a, I'm a, ice fishing is my favorite sport. I love ice fishing. Do you yeah. ice fish? Yeah, oh yeah. Oh, all right. Yeah. So, so my target species, my favorite fish to catch for the ice is a white perch, which is a temperate bass, the, a close cousin to the striped bass. They're anadromous like the striper. They run the same life cycle, yep. and they act like stripers. Have you? Do you fish for white perch in the lakes? I I've Have caught them any? before. I haven't. I haven't in a while. Um, yeah. But when I was a kid, I used to fish for them all the time in a lake near my house. Um, yeah, it, but I've, I've, the, I've always the, been kind of too big and heavy to ice fish. <laughs> <laughs> I could, well, listen, so I have, my daughter's 11 years old. Your daughter's 10. Yeah. Uh, my daughter loves ice fishing. You have a, I have, I have shanties out on the lakes in New Hampshire. You're yeah. open invitation to come out with us. If you ever want to get up here. And oh, yeah, that perch awesome. them. I would love uh, that. I want to try. Oh, she would. And we have shanties with underwater cameras and sonars, all the things. But because white perch and, and striped bass are close cousins, I now want to try like the small version of a rattlesnaker on a school of white perch and see if that makes a difference. Because now I'm excited about this like crossover from striper fishing into white perch fishing. And yeah, see if you, know, I, you know, whenever you bring in some kind of sound into fishing, it's always, it's always a benefit. You know, I mean, the sound, you know, fish hunt through through three different things. You know, they they use sound first, and then their eyesight, and then their sense of smell. They're not really, they don't really have great eyesight, and and especially the striped bass, they really can't see that well. They're in dirtier water. You know, they're caught at night. They're not seeing what they're eating. They're hearing it and then smelling it, and then they see it at the very end for the attack. So I've always always tried to make sound be a part of my you know, and everybody jokes, why don't you put a rattle in this? Why don't you put a rattle in that? Yeah, but it works. You know what I mean? Especially if you have a sound that mimics something in, that they're eating. You know, like the rattlesinker sounds like, it sounds like a lobster that's, uh, see, lobsters have a, a, a 10 decibel buzzing sound that is a warning signal. It comes right off of their antennas and it, it warns other lobster that there's a predator in the area. So, you know, when I was catching big stripers when I was younger and they all had lobster in them, I was, you know, I, I immediately wanted to find out more about the lobster and how could I make a sound like a lobster does. And then after studying the lobster with them in tanks and tormenting them so they start buzzing and recording those sounds and stuff like that, you know, that's how the rattlesinker came out. And, and you know, it's it's not some kind of snake oil. It's It's something that works, you know. And, you yeah. know, I never really made it to be a business either. You know, I made it for me to catch more bass and bigger bass. And it just became, you know, it became a business on its own after, the, especially after the world record and a few, a few big tournaments I won. Everybody, you know, wanted to know, you know, how and why. And, and I, when I told them they all wanted one and that's how really the business started. Well, if you didn't do it, somebody else would have stolen it. So you might as well be the one making the money off of it. So. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I think that's know, fair. It's not, it's not like it makes a ton of money, but it, you know, it, it's, uh, it, it has potential, you know, especially if a oh, bigger sure. company, if a bigger company came to me and said, you know, we, we want to mass produce the rattlesinker, you know, I'd be like, go ahead. I'd show them yep, exactly it out. what to do, you know, <laughs> yeah. it, it, whatever gets me out there so I could fish more and not making these things. 
<laughs> you don't want to be you don't want to be a manufacturer. You want to be a fisherman. That's right. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Uh, so so people are going to be asking, hey, Clay, you didn't ask the one question. So I'm going to ask you the one question. What's the biggest secret in striper fishing? Well, you know, if, if you want to <laughs> if you want to catch big ones, it's definitely mm-hmm. st- you have to be in areas where big ones hang out. And like you said before, <laughs> you know, like you said before, you know, the guy, the, the fight with the lobster, the lobster men, you know, I, I know that big striped bass love to eat big lobster, you know? So I knew that this area where all these lobster pots were, was one of the best striped bass fishing areas in Connecticut. And I could never get a good drift over the area because there was lobster pots everywhere. So I would drag the lobster pots out and move them off the reef. And, you know, the lobster men, eventually confronted me at the bait, sh- the you know the bait shop about it and and sure. you know, it, it it got into an ugly confrontation but you know what when it was over with uh he doesn't put his pots anymore where i want to do my drifts and i don't move his pots anymore out of the way without talking to him <laughs> sounds like you win <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right hey uh how can people follow you if they want on instagram or facebook where's the best place people can follow your adventures yeah, we're on Instagram and World Record Striper Company and Facebook, World Record Striper Company, and or just uh, go on the website, uh, worldrecordstripercompany.com, and uh, we have a blog on there, and, and, uh, and you can follow us there as well, or email us. That's perfect. That's perfect. I'll put links up at fishners.com so people can get on there and follow. And we're giving away an autographed copy of Born to Fish. Greg, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Um, I'm glad uh, to have read your book. I, I feel excited for you, uh, and I can't wait to see what you do next. Well, thanks for having me. I, I enjoyed it. All right. That was fun. Uh, we, once again, thanks, Greg Meyerson, for, for coming on the show. We'll put links at fishnurse.com and on where you can buy this book. But now, let's talk about how you can win your own, very own autographed copy of Born to Fish. This is really easy. Those of you who are already donating to our show at patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash fish nerds, you're already entered to win this book. But if you're not already giving us a little bit of cash, <laughs> uh, I'm, or a little bit of money on Patreon, you're not entered. Here's how you enter. Go to patreon.com slash fish nerds. Give us a donation to the show in any amount. These are ongoing donations. So you might say, I'm going to give you a dollar per episode, $4 a month. Uh, at ongoing, and you're entered just like that. I'll also mail you some de- decals and things uh, to thank you. Uh, that's how we fund our show. That's our that, that's what keeps our show going. Patreon.com slash Fish Nerds. And that keeps money in the bank. It's how we pay for our hosting fees or equipment. That's how we, you know, our, our, we have field recorders. So we can travel around. We can bring the stuff with us. Computers. All this thing that costs money to run a podcast is paid for by you, our listeners, at Patreon.com slash Fish Nerds. So if you're there, you're already entered. If you're not there and you want a copy of this book, get there and you'll be entered. And I'll in June I'll do a random drawing and you can you can totally win this book plus some decals and other things. If you give us five dollars an episode, I'll mail you a fish nerd's hat. If you give us twenty five dollars an episode, which is a lot of money, that's a real sponsorship level. Um, you don't get a real ad, but you get you're giving us real money. Uh, it's a hundred dollars a month. I will say the name of your business. On the podcast, for example, our friend uh, Josh Lopes at LopesTax.com gave us that money. He's been doing it for a long time. He actually gets business from being on our podcast. Go to LopesTax.com if you want a tax guy in Massachusetts. He's great. Uh, and he gives us money. So he's a fish nerd. So we love him. But anyway, go to go to Patreon.com slash Fish Nerds. Help us crowdfund this show. It's like, it's like a Kickstarter for ongoing art projects. And I'm an artist. Damn it. Give us your money. This episode's also brought to you by the Fish Nerds Guide Service. That's right. We are here and ready to bring your family on a guided fishing trip on a state-of-the-art brand new fishing pontoon boat. Yep, I said pontoon boat. This is a comfortable but serious fishing machine. We can troll for lake trout and salmon, cast for bass, or cruise into a cove and put the herd on some perch and panfish. Head to fishnerds.com for rates. Call me at 603-986-4335 for bookings. We are the only guide service in the White Mountains that can bring your whole family fishing. So get yourself to the White Mountains uh, of New Hampshire for your fishing trip. We also are brought to you by... 
Thirst Productions. It's a one-man digital media agency catering to small businesses by helping them improve their online presence from websites to SEO, search engine optimization, social media, and targeted advertising, website analytics, and website maintenance. Rich helps business speak for businesses speak for the customers more efficiently thirst productions also gives back to cold water fishy conservation projects by working with select nonprofits at a deeply reduced rate to help them better share their message so if you're a small business who needs a digital facelift or if you work with a nonprofit in need of a new one get in touch with rich at thirstproductions.com that's thirstproductions.com Oh, yeah. Let's talk about sex, baby. Let's talk about you and me. Let's talk about all the good and the bad things that will be. Let's talk about sex. Yeah, we're talking about bass sex. This is actually from BassResource.com. As I promised, we are talking about it. Here we go. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid to, to, to wade into these uncharted sexy waters. Oh, the sexiest. All right, so when water temperatures are between 55 and 65 degrees, largemouth bass seek out shallow, protected areas for spawning. They, this is the optimal temperature. Now, lakes don't freeze, don't freeze, don't, don't have consistent temperatures, but that's the right kind of range for them. Uh, if you're in, in the northern United States, that's about right now. This time of year is about right in there for, I think in the south, it's, it's a little bit earlier. Uh, but they like this. Uh, the spawning area must have direct access to the sun's rays, so look for shallow flats protect, protected by or protect, protected from rough waters. Usually 10, 10 feet from shore is a great spot, uh, and in depth of water, 1 to 6 feet. So real shallow, close to shore. They like that. I don't know why. Maybe it's warm. Good place for incubating eggs. I don't know. The spot is usually... Uh, the male chooses a site that's easy to defend near a pocket of... of uh, of uh, brushes and stuff so it can really kind of hide so like near sunken logs or boulders and with an easy access to deep water right so if there's predation and they can take off in addition the male will not build a nest within 30 feet of another visible spawning nest so you might see them close together but usually there's like something breaking up the line of sight so they kind of like because they're so aggressive they'll just kill each other the nests look like uh, black or white patches depending on the bottom structure. Generally speaking, the bigger the bass, the deeper the water, and the earlier they're going to spawn, which is really good. Now, they, and they're so aggressive this time of year, so they really, they'll, they'll, they'll attack anything. Now, this is not about the ethics of fishing during the spawn. I, I by the way, for the record, I happily <laughs> catch a bass during the spawn because I'm happy to catch a bass whenever I can. But some people say it's bad for the fishes. I can't imagine it being good for them. So we can have that conversation conversation another time. But if you are going to fish for them, uh, right now um, people are using uh, spinner baits and soft plastics in the red. They call them red beds, reed beds. Uh, top water, top water uh, baits work really great if you're not in the weedy areas, uh, which I really like because I like to watch a bass exploding. If you fish after a cold front moves through, bass, um, they're not going to take off into um, deep water. They're going to stay into heavy cover. Then they come right back up. So you can flip flip jigs and worms into the heavy cover. If you're, if you're, if you're, uh, if you're getting attacked but not hooking up, you're probably just attracting those fish. They're just attacking it, but they're not eating it. They like, bump into it. They move it around. So you're going to sh- have to switch to like hookier things. Um, this is, by the way, the only, my only time I really fly fish exclusively is bass fishing on the spawn. I like to use like crawfish patterns. My friend James Frank, Frank James Frank from FranksFlyArts.com, taught me some crawfish patterns for fly fishing. I love, 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 love catching a bass uh, on on the spawning bed with because you can sight fish for them and smack them in the head till they till they bite it. So it's a lot of fun. Uh, the ethics of fishing on the spawn, I'm with you guys. Probably not great for the fish. However, in the northern United States where I live, they're kind of an invasive fish. So you know who cares? Go out, catch them, have a good time. I love to hear your thoughts on this. You can feel free to email Clay at fishnurse.com or go on to Facebook and get in the discussion of should we fish for bass or any fish during the spawn. Some say yes, some say no, some say fish whenever you can. I don't care. 
That's my <laughs> useless attitude. All right, so as I, I was approached by a high school kid named Zach. Now, in New Hampshire, and I mentioned this during the interview, but in New Hampshire, you're not allowed to drop out of high school when you're 16. Most states, 16 is the law. New Hampshire, a few years ago, said, you know what? You're 16. You're not allowed to drop out of school. But it turns out school is not a good match for every kid, right? So what we did in New Hampshire is we have alternative, way, alternative ways to get your education. You can do field work. You can go to college early. You can take classes online. You can take night school. You can get independent uh, learning contracts, uh, which is what our friend Zach did. He has a teacher who works one-on-one with him to earn his high school credits. And as part of that, he has to do real experience and interview real people. And he interviewed me about careers in the fishing industry. I had to inform him very quickly that I'm no expert because uh, I can't figure out how to make my own business work. But <laughs> we had fun anyway. I pushed record on my audio recorder while we were t- chatting just so I can capture this and you can see what, what that conversation was like. Uh, kind of funny thing. We were sitting outside the coffee shop, dead quiet, just beautiful out, sunny, and as soon as I pushed record, giant trucks started driving by, like just one after the other, just huge propane trucks just whizzing by us. So the interview gets interrupted a few times with, with monster trucks coming by, but it was a good time. Hope you enjoy it. How about Zach, uh, if you're listening, thank you so much for thinking of, of me. It's kind of uh, humbling to be... Uh, okay, Fish Nerds, this is Clay Groves. We're sitting at the uh, Sweet we Maple Cafe you, in beautiful downtown Conway, New Hampshire. And we're hanging out with Zach and his teacher, Keith. We're going to leave their last names off because this is super secret stuff today. But uh, Zach is doing a project on fishing, and we're going to be chatting about that for a little bit and see what it's all about. Hi, Zach. How you doing? Where are you from? I'm from uh, Albany, New Hampshire. Right. Albany is the biggest town in the state by square miles. You know that? No, I didn't. Now you know. Wow. Yeah, not by population. Wow. Yeah. And it's almost all national forest. That's great. <laughs> all right, so you're doing a project for school to yep. help you get towards your graduation. We're going to just be quiet when trucks drive by. <laughs> Tell me, what, what is your project? Um, well, currently I'm doing an ELO, and that's an extended learning opportunity on ichthyology. That's the study of fish, which everybody should know. Should know. If you listen to the Fishers <laughs> podcast, you don't know that. We're in some real trouble. Yeah. yeah. Um, and um, I'm looking under ichthyology, like what you can do uh, for like careers and stuff. Um, like looking at like the big uh, corporations on like what you can do underneath, like looking at retail and starting an own, your own business. And uh, so, in your in your in your research, is there a direction you're looking at? Now, okay, I want to be in the fishing business. I want to make money. What is there? Is there a way that you found like, oh, that's the way I want to go? What is that way? Because by the way, I need the information. I need to know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just kind of really liked fishing when I was younger. Um, I uh, would be fishing at my grandmother's lake house on Lake Quinnipesaukee when I was, uh, was it like, I think maybe six or seven. I'd go in, go up to my knees, and just grab fish right out of the, <laughs> theoretically with a, with a net, um, but try to grab them with my hands. I think um, we've all spent time <laughs> hand fishing, yeah. Yeah. Um, so noisy. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I've just been working on uh, school. I haven't really been fishing for a while. Uh, I just got back into it maybe like a month ago. Um, and uh, I was uh, so clo- I'm so close to graduating high school. I figured because like I wasn't really learning that much in high school, and it was just really hard. Every everything was tough, and a bunch of homework and stuff, and. Uh, my mom said, why don't we just go and uh, find something else you can do to get your credits in school? Yeah, let me give a little background. People not in New Hampshire. New Hampshire, a few years ago, passed a law that said you're not allowed to drop out of school if you're not 18 years old, which I think, by the way, is positive. Like, you shouldn't be or You can't do other things in your life until you're 18, so why not? Yeah. You can't drop out of school. So what they did was they created a lot of other programs to help students like you who maybe weren't, it wasn't working out being a regular school day to find an alternative way to get their degree, which I think was really smart, and it seems to be working for you. Oh, yeah. 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 you got a good teacher hanging out with you. I mean, it's like a, it's like a one-on-one mentor. <laughs> I, I have a good fishing. teacher, too. Yeah. Yeah, he <laughs> takes me fishing, uh-huh. and uh, I'm actually teaching him a, a little, uh, little Absolutely, bit. Absolutely, yeah. 
Well, that's the thing about fishing is we all have our own style, right? Oh, and so yeah. even those of us who think we're great at it, when we fish with someone else, we're like, oh, I never done it that way, or that shouldn't work, and, and it works. And Little you're just, secrets that other people have. Yeah. Um, so you work on this, and so tell me, where's the money in fishing careers? Where are you going to earn your money? Um, I don't. I'm not really doing it for the money. Because if a career, money has to be connected to it. Otherwise, it's a hobby, right? Um, well, maybe like teaching kids how to fly fish or yeah. fish in general. Um, really haven't got much into detail about that. I'm starting to. You know, I can recommend at your age, um, I, I don't know if you're planning on going off to college or not, but either way, uh, and you can answer that if you want to, I don't care, um, is, is working at summer camps. If you like fishing, most have a fishing program. And so you could be a counselor on a fishing boat. Actually, I worked my summer job last 10 years. I've been a counselor on a fishing boat. It's, it's the most fun. Every day you get on the boat with a bunch of kids, you drive out, you fish, come back in. Get more kids, drive out, fish, come back in. Fantastic. You make new friends. You get, gain some skills. Um, and it, your confidence grows from having to teach like that, too. So it's just my... At your age. If I was smart at your age, I would have been doing work like that. Plus, plus you meet people from all over the world, you know, so... You did a camp last year? Yeah, I was, I was just about to say that. Yeah. Uh, I went to um, a camp called Trout Camp. Yes, uh, I know about Trout Camp. Yeah. So did you go to camp as a student or as, as a, a counselor? Student. Yeah. As a student. And um, they um, they taught me all about, like, the dinner plates and stuff and, like, how to tie the uh, improved clench knot and uh, so how, how to tie how flies. How many knots do you know? Uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that was been a while. That was a while ago, and uh, I know the fisherman's knot. That's the only knot I know. <laughs> like I know there's a lot of knots I know one knot you know that's really funny and I could have used a good knot because the other day I was mooring my pontoon boat for the first time and mm. I made these two five gallon buckets cement um, full of cement with a big eye hole in top yeah. and I put a nine foot chain through it and I'm yep. like, it's beautiful I had this like rope that is water resistant so it's like really slippery and waxy and I tied what I thought was a good knot and I threw those things off the boat I watched the chain go off the boat and I watched the knot came on, come undone and stay on the boat with the rope so I lost my anchors <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, it's good to know knots yeah. oh, yeah. <laughs> how many trucks did we by like, we sat here for like an hour and it was yeah. dead quiet <laughs> we yeah. and then we put that yeah. on and then yeah. so you also might want to there's another one Big cocaine trucks. Yeah. Um, you also may want to head up to North Country Angler and talk to Steve up there. Oh, yeah. He just bought that shop uh, a year or a half. Maybe I think he ago. moved from uh, yeah moved closer to actually where it all started. Yeah, his name is Steve, and uh, and he'd be worth your time to make a trip up there and say, "Hey, I was talking to Clay. He said I'm, I'm looking at fishing careers in the fishing industry. It might be worth talking to you. He could tell you if it's making money in it." Oh yeah. I think I have the answer, but I'm not going to tell you. I've uh, been up over there a yeah. um, couple of times because uh, I've been fishing on the Saco. You get anything? Uh, no. no Saco is a terrible place. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but he uh, showed me, or he didn't show me, but he told me about like Outlook Pool and stuff. And uh, I, for, I, I, he told me, like, look at a, around a bend and then you'll see a pool. Yep. I walked so far up. I didn't see a pool. Mm-hmm. I saw a bunch of bends, though. Well, Sometimes the pools are smaller than you think. Yeah, yeah. And, and I find with, with, with fishing is you'll be surprised what little pockets hold fish. And it could be like just like one foot deep, just a perfect backwater pocket, and there's a fish sitting right in there. And you can't only see it. So. But yeah, he's a good resource for you too. And then you may want to talk to um, truck drivers, I guess that's it. <laughs> but you may, you may, you may want to cut, call up um, like fishing distributors too and, and talk to... Um, to people who are in the industry as far as that side of industry goes because there's a whole ton of careers in in distribution of of like of not bait but like of uh food like fish for food so yeah, there's a lot of a lot of places you can go with fishing as your you know and it's social science you know aquariums that sort of thing he's yeah. also uh doing something uh on uh with mr vosi uh, about the, the mayfly hatch yes does and, he fish uh, uh, he does i had no idea yeah yeah <laughs> Um, I've always been a little afraid of him. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think you're alone. <laughs> <laughs> nah, he's pretty intimidating. Yeah, though. he's a good dude, though. He but is. he's funny. Yeah. Well, Zach, good. Zach's taking a few trips with him up to the hatchery. But the Berlin, Berlin hatchery. hatchery. Oh, it's a great place to go. Yep. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. And then yeah. he's doing some science with Mr. Yana over Joe there Yana at the school as well. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I've never fished with Joe Yana, but I've hung out with him. 
There's also, if you if you're looking for a field trip, go to the trout farm down in Ossipee. Mm-hmm. Those guys have been on on the show, um, yeah. and they they produce down there. They produce steelhead salmon, which then are raised in pens in the Piscataqua River down in Portsmouth, really? and then used in restaurants. So they call it local steelhead, but it's wow. actually local to Ossipee. <laughs> and all, by the way, do you know what? The equivalent fish to a steelhead, the identical fish is? I do not. Rainbow trout. Really? Oh, there's no, there's biologically, I think they're identical fish, and the difference is how they are grown. Wow. Or so, like a sea run wow. rainbow trout would be a steelhead. Huh. So, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, it's because steelhead fishermen want to think they're better than rainbow trout fishermen. <laughs> theory, they're the same thing. It's always the same thing, yeah. Every, every fisher person wants to think their way is the best and the yeah. right way. And uh, my, I don't care about any of it. I just like catching fish. So. Yeah. yeah. All right. Any parting words? Final thoughts? What's the biggest secret in fishing? Uh, biggest secret in fishing is just to have fun and uh, just enjoy your surroundings. Perfect. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Good. Well, thank you. And uh, if you if you want it, when you finish the project, if you want to share something with with us, go on Facebook and find the Fish Nerds group and share share it with us and get some feedback Um, people on our group are pretty positive so yeah alright thank you very much alright thank you thank you Clay so that's it you've listened to a bunch of fish nerds when you definitely should have been fishing I'd like to thank our families for supporting us while we podcast go on fishing quests and do all the silly things that nerds do very very big special thanks to Greg Meyerson from uh from the World Record Striper Fishing Company, and uh, thank you so much for uh, for sending me a copy of your book, Born to Fish. Rem- remember, you can win a cop autograph copy of this book by going to patreon.com slash fishnerds, helping us crowdfund this show. Also, a big thanks to Zach. Zank, thanks for, uh, for letting me sit with you and have coffee and chat about fishing jobs. So until next time, follow the code of the fish nerds. Spawn early and often. Avoid free lunches with strings attached and swim against the current. <laughs>